Okay. Don't touch anything. Jesus. What's with you? Okay, then let me. What do you have to touch? Um, okay, I'm sorry, Adam. You could continue. Okay, then we continue. So, um, however, I forgot where I was and what stories you didn't hear. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, uh, uh, the northeast corner of Hungary uh, was don dominated by the Orthodox community. And, uh, well, they dressed differently than the majority. They spoke a different language than the majority did. Um, and um, they uh, prayed in uh, prayer houses, uh, in places of worship that were unfamiliar for Christians. Um, even uh, today, um, the um, dominant congregation in Hungary is uh, the uh, neolog. And the northeast corner of the country, like Bodro, Keresztur, Tokai, uh, and so on, is dominated by uh, the Orthodox. And regardless of me saying that um, the neologues dominate, dominate Budapest, um, the Orthodox community still built a uh, synagogue here, and that's the one which is coming up in what? front of us. What? It was... It was built, uh, this synagogue was actually built in 1912 and 13. Yeah, did you get back in? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this was built in 1912 and uh, 13. And um, well, it was designed actually by two. Uh, Jewish architects by the Lefrel brothers. 1912 and 13, it was designed in Art Nouveau style. And um, Art Nouveau was considered the most expensive available architectural style at the time. Um, the Orthodox community uh, still wanted to provide here a uh, eternal message, if you wish, a representation. Uh, in the Hungarian capital city uh, with a synagogue that could fit 1,000 people in. Um, today, the synagogue is not uh, used for uh, communal services. Um, a small praying house, a praying room is being uh, used uh, by the uh, local Orthodox community, which is something between 35 to 40 families in uh, total. Um, however, at the time when the synagogue was built, they had all the money under the clear blue sky and they can hire the most expensive craftsmen uh, to design their synagogue. Uh, craftsmen were absolutely important uh, source of, um, um, of um, showing off. Um, and by hiring, for example, Miksha Roth as um, the craftsman for the stained glass windows that you can see right in the middle of your screen. Uh, Miksha Roth was the guy who also delivered the stained glass windows for the House of Parliament building. Uh, they could communicate that they have all the money under the clear blue sky and uh, they are not afraid to use it. And by showing off, by showing their money, they could also show their political connections and that they shall be recognized as well. Um, and under recognition, I mean that in 1868, uh, when the um, Jewish Congress was put together, the Hungarian state first recognized the neologues. And as the Orthodox uh, congregation put so much effort into making, believe, making the state believe that neologues aren't even Jewish, uh, that actually the state just got pissed at them and um, the Orthodox were this way, the last to be recognized and uh, the last whose secular platform uh, was recognized by the Hungarian state. Even today, uh, the neologues, the Orthodox, uh, the Lubovic and the so-called status quo ante, which uh, were the independent communities that didn't uh, join neither the neolog nor the Orthodox uh, 
uh, movement have separate secular platforms um, in, um, in Hungary. And there is not too much communication between Orthodox and neologues, uh, between uh, Lubovitch and uh, Orthodox, and so on and so forth. So not so minimal, actually, uh, that uh, the uh, Lubovitch congregation sued uh, the Orthodox and the uh, neologues um, in Israel on the religious uh, court, uh, basically for uh, money. Because uh, a lot of um, uh, facilities, uh, religious facilities, were confiscated uh, during the time of socialism and communism that were not uh, possible to return uh, to the neologues, orthodox, uh, and so on. Uh, so the Hungarian state decided to pay an annual compensation for using those uh, properties to use those for using those uh, those buildings and so on. And as uh, after the political transition, the only existing congregation was the neolog. They got all the compensation. And when the Orthodox congregation was reborn, the neologs and the Orthodox had to decide themselves uh, who shall get uh, which part uh, of the of the pie. And when the Lubovitch was born in Hungary, well. Uh, they wanted to get a piece of the cake, the piece of a pie as well. Um, and that led to um, quite a bit of uh, confrontation in um, Hungary. So this is actually a recent uh, thing in uh, Hungary and a recent court case in Israel to my uh, understanding. You may have learned it, uh, read about these in the uh, papers as well. Um, uh, the entire block, I mean, the block of the Freilich brothers uh, designed um, Orthodox uh, synagogue still belongs to the Orthodox uh, community. And if I compress the distance a little bit, um, behind it features actually a courtyard as well, which features an Upe. Um, there are two kosher restaurants here, Carmel and uh, Hana. Carmel also runs a cafe, a Tel Aviv cafe which is marked with that green sign. And in the courtyard, um, there used to be a um, Orthodox uh, primary school, separate for boys and for girls, which is not in operation any longer in its original place. However, both the Lubovitch and the Orthodox have uh, their uh, primary schools. Uh, to my understanding, there are no Orthodox high schools in um, Hungary. Uh, um, and uh, because there are no Orthodox high schools, when the kids are in uh, high school age, families tend to relocate to Vienna, which not just features uh, more kosher shops, uh, but it offers more um, institutions for Orthodox uh, families. Uh, Vienna has a significantly smaller uh, Jewish community than Budapest has, which according to the rabbis, and it's very important that um, uh, it is the rabbis data and not the state uh, data that we harvest during the national uh, censuses. Uh, when it comes to the national census, we have to answer questions about our religious views, uh, but we are only forced to answer the questions. We are not forced to tell the truth. And we try to keep as much personal data for ourselves. So um, according to the state, um, during the last national census, about uh, 11,000 people checked the Jewish box when it came to the questions about religious views. And according to rabbis, the Hungarian Jewish community is something between 100 and 125,000. So there is a huge uh, difference um, between what rabbis say and between what uh, the state says. Um, my personal note is when uh, I had to fill out these forms, I did not answer to the questions uh, truthfully. So I tend to uh, go with uh, the rabbi's point of view. And this would be uh, currently the only operational mikveh ritual bathhouse of Budapest operated by the Orthodox uh, community and the Orthodoxia, the land of the Orthodox, 
you can see it's a block away from uh, where we are standing. This mikveh was actually built in uh, between 1926 and 1928 was fallen into complete disrepair uh, during the time of uh, socialism and communism where no money was invested into um, uh, religious institutions. In 2002, uh, the uh, Orthodox community decided to um, fix up uh, this mikveh and they hired a uh, Hasidic plumber from uh, New York City um, who did uh, a splendid job here. Um, and while he was working on this mikvah, actually he was flying back and forth between New York and uh, Budapest. He flew back home every Thursday and uh, he came back to uh, Budapest every Sunday. So this way he could spend Shabbat with his, uh, with his family. Uh, when he um, called this project already, well, uh, and was obviously overseen by the Orthodox rabbi of Budapest, by one Orthodox rabbi from Israel, and by an Orthodox rabbi from Vienna as well. They uh, poured 2,000 liters of wine in the pools, and then they dwelled the water out until it became transparent again. And just like a, just like Chicago offering so many different layers of uh, Irish heritage, uh, Ukrainian city, um, Chinatown and so on and so forth. The historical Jewish quarter as well um, has uh, multiple layers. And as I mentioned, it is known as uh, the, it was known as the party capital of, um, of uh, continental Europe. Um, and uh, both the um, Orthodox uh, congregation and the uh, Lubovitch as well, who have commercial real estate in this area, rent those out and from the rent they can run their institutions and right next to the ritual bathhouse there is a uh, food court which is open you know until like 2 a.m for those who have uh, an urgent need of um of a late night snack um they can uh, find they can get a snack there till uh, 2 um, a.m so right next to a ritual uh, bathhouse there is a uh, you know an institution for uh, midnight uh, cravings and on the other side actually of the ritual bathhouse um, one of the most famous uh, watering hole one of the most famous bar is to be found uh, simpler gardens and it happens to be uh, the first and most famous ruin bar of Budapest the building which is too dangerous to live in, but still safe enough to drink in. Um, and actually the reason why such a uh, institution, such a watering hole uh, could born in this neighborhood is that uh, this entire uh, neighborhood is under, is under the UNESCO's protection um, as a buffer zone for Andrashi Avenue, which is a UNESCO site, it's a cultural heritage site. And according to uh, the UNESCO, protecting one single street is uh, not a good idea. Um, so they also protect uh, the neighboring uh, neighborhoods as well, sort of like a uh, buffer zone. And uh, one of those neighborhoods happens to be the historical Jewish quarter, which means that most of these buildings that actually also saw um, the um, ghetto, which was set up here, on the 29th of November 1944 and was liberated on the 18th of January 1945. So they saw an uh, unbelievable amount of uh, personal uh, tragedy and, and uh, um, a community's uh, tragedy as, as well. Well, uh, they are all under uh, protection of the UNESCO and the uh, Hungarian state as well and the local municipality too. And uh, this way, all those uh, memories um, that these houses uh, houses uh, seen, they are preserved till the end of, uh, till the end of time, which I find um, very nice. And we will uh, cross the street carefully. 
so that I can provide you a nice angle of our next uh, synagogue. And there is also a police officer and officers don't really fancy being uh, videotaped. So sorry for the dull image, but safety first. <laughs> so the building across the street that looks very much like a mosque happens to be uh, the Temple of Heroes. It was designed, it was designed in uh, 1932. It aimed uh, to uh, um, highlight the fact that during the First World War, 10,000 Jewish soldiers died for Hungary as heroes, and the Hungarian state um, wished to commemorate them uh, somehow. The idea was that the best way to commemorate uh, the heroic efforts of Jewish communities is to sponsor a new synagogue, which uh, became uh, this one, uh, designed in 32 in uh, Byzantine uh, style. Uh, between the fall and the spring holidays, uh, the local neolog community happens to use the Temple of Heroes. And between spring and fall, uh, they use the Dohany Street Synagogue right next door to it. The Temple of Heroes is much smaller, much more intimate, and, uh, and um, it requires much less overhead uh, to be paid. And, um, also quite intimate, about 200 people fit, and that would be the active size of, uh, of the uh, community here. Um, the Dohany Street Synagogue's uh, capacity is actually 3,000 seated, and with 3,000 seats, the Dohany Street Synagogue happens to be the uh, fourth largest place of worship in uh, uh, you can see the Temple of Heroes, ah, sorry, uh, the well, Tree of Life and the Temple of Heroes, but now our protagonist is the uh, Tree of Life. Um, the Tree of Life was sponsored by the Lauder and by the uh, Curtis family. Oh, that was difficult, uh, by the Curtis family. The Emmanuel Foundation, founded by these two families, raised five million US dollars for the restoration of the Dohany Street Synagogue, which took place between 1991 and 1996. Um, and um, the Curtis family uh, initiated or commissioned um, the Tree of Life uh, to be erected. One can purchase the leaves of uh, the Tree of Life, and those names can be engraved on the leaves um, who died during the Holocaust. In the middle, you can see this black marble stone uh, featuring two missing tablets. Uh, we refer to those as uh, transparent tablets, and it aims to highlight the fact uh, to us uh, that we failed to follow the Ten Commandments uh, during the uh, Second uh, World War. And while we move on towards the um, Dohain Street Synagogue's uh, main facade, should you have any questions, feel free to uh, unmute yourself. Feel free to ask. Well, Adam, um, I didn't, maybe you, you said earlier, but how many people live in the Jewish quarter? Um, well, currently, I can only tell you how many people live in the entire district. Uh, the entire district, which is now double as large as the formal ghetto was, is the home of 50,000 people, uh, making it one of the most dense uh, neighborhoods. Um, we have no data on how many people live in the so-called uh, historical Jewish quarter in Budapest. And we don't know how many people of them are Jewish. We don't know exactly where Jewish people live in uh, Budapest. They may live whichever quarter they, uh, whichever district they please. Um, according to rabbis uh, in Budapest, the community is something around 100,000 big. Um, and we consider the entire country's uh, uh, Jewish community to be 100, 125,000 big. It is said that about 80% of all the Hungarian uh, Jews 
live within the boundaries of the Hungarian uh, capital city, but not necessarily in uh, this neighborhood. And in the meantime, we are passing by at the uh, Dohányi Street Synagogue. The Dohányi Street Synagogue that still features uh, wounds from the Second World War. 27 grenades hit the uh, Dohányi Street Synagogue as well, and two wounds been kept um, till eternity uh, to remind people what happened here during the um, Second World War. Um, these two yellow lines that you can see ahead of us, they um, symbolize the formal walls of the ghetto. Uh, the uh, Dohain Street Synagogue was part of the uh, Budapest uh, ghetto. And as such, it was not as heavily bombarded as uh, the rest of the city was. And it became obvious for the German troops uh, pretty fast that the synagogue is safer and the ghetto is safer than the rest of the city. So actually German troops moved into the Dohain Street Synagogue. So this synagogue survived the Second World War thanks to the German army. Um, the German army that uh, set up uh, canteens and sleeping quarters inside the synagogue, uh, the um, balconies, the upper floors, uh, which otherwise would be used by ladies, uh, were used by the Gestapo, and they set up radio stations on the roof of the uh, Dohain Street uh, synagogue. As I mentioned, the synagogue has the capacity of uh, 3,000, um, 1,460 seats on the first floor, and the rest of the seats are on the two uh, balconies. Uh, the two onion-shaped domes uh, were the highest domes of the city until the St. Stephen's Basilica and the House of Parliament been built. Uh, the domes feature a uh, golden uh, belt. That golden um, belt is actually from 24 karat gold. It is said that more gold was used uh, for the Dohain Street Synagogue's uh, decoration that they used for the House of Parliament, which actually was 80 pounds of 24 karat gold. The style is sort of similar for the Dohany Street Synagogue as it is for the uh, Rumbach Street Synagogue. It was also built by the um, neologues, but this synagogue actually features an organ inside, which like I said, was not to be digested by the more conservative uh, branch of the uh, neolog community here. So they built a second one, the Rumbach uh, Street Synagogue. Um, the organ here is actually behind the uh, Ark of Covenant, which is on the closest wall to uh, Jerusalem. And to make sure that all seats can face Jerusalem, as you can see, the Dohany Street Synagogue does not follow the line of the Dohany Street itself. There is a small park in front which we named after uh, Tivadar Herzl, known as one of the founders of Zionism and, and one of the founders of Israel. Uh, he was born in a house that once stood here, where today the street is. Uh, his uh, birth house was later demolished and the synagogue was uh, actually extended with a uh, museum. Um, today, there is a mini school statue of uh, Herzl Tivadar um, across from the Dohany Street uh, Synagogue. And that mini school statue was actually designed by a Ukrainian sculptor by Mihai Kolotko. And as Tivadar Herzl is also known as one of the first urban cyclists of Budapest, he's depicted with his. Uh, bicycle, basically right where he was uh, born. So from across the street, one can really um, get an idea of how humongous the Dohany Street Synagogue is um, and uh, how um, 
significant these two towers are um, in the skyline of uh, Budapest. Um, same architectural influences can be traced on the uh, Dohany Street Synagogue's facade as well, uh, Byzantine battlement, um, Moorish uh, horizontal lines, uh, orange and yellow lines, uh, exposed uh, brick, and uh, well, the two towers show the influence of Islamic art. And well, basically, this is what we managed to fit in to a uh, hour long um, introduction to the um, historical Jewish quarter. Um, so before we conclude our virtual tour, if you have any other questions that I can answer, um, well, feel free to unmute yourself and um, I'll do my best what to answer square? those questions. Thank you very much, Adam. How many square miles is the Jewish quarter? Um, well, what I can tell you is that the ghetto, which basically overlaps uh, with the um, so-called historical Jewish quarter is 0 0.3 square kilometers. Um, small or large, depending uh, whether if the glass is half full or half empty. Okay, did you get okay. rid of the Ukrainian refugees, Jewish refugees? Um, one second, um, fire truck is passing by and I can't really hear anything. Would you mind repeating your question? It was regarding the Ukrainian uh, Jewish refugees. Did you receive uh, very many in, uh, in, in past Budapest? Um, well, uh, the thing is that uh, due to the ongoing war in our neighboring country, uh, the Jewish uh, institutions are at the border um, helping, um, helping refugees, uh, assisting them on their way to um, Israel, like most of them would continue there, either in an organized fashion um, or uh, organized uh, individually. Um, I must say that uh, the Jewish organizations uh, help uh, Jewish refugees, uh, Jews fleeing away from, uh, from Ukraine and Every other NGO, every other volunteer um, helps whoever uh, requires help. Um, in some cases, it's difficult to stomach. Um, stomach this, that there are people who don't differentiate because it's not time to differentiate between um, uh, religious views mm -hmm. and depending on um, on color um, if one needs help then we should have both arms wide open um, it's my absolutely personal opinion um, i'm involved or i was involved as a, uh, as a volunteer uh, raising money uh, being at the train stations, um, and so on and so forth. Um, that's my personal view. But bottom line is that, yes, Jewish organizations do help Jews fleeing away from, uh, from Ukraine, and they assist them uh, on their way to uh, Israel. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions for Adam? Yes. Adam. Yes. There is name of Raul Wallenberg still known in Hungary? Uh, there is a Raul Wallenberg uh, memorial uh, that I showed at the beginning of the tour. Uh, the park uh, where uh, the Tree of Life is, is named after Raul Wallenberg. There is a street in the new Jewish quarter named after Raul Wallenberg where his office was. And there is also a bust of, uh, of Raul Wallenberg. However, Raul Wallenberg was uh, arrested by the Soviet troops, uh, Soviet HQ on the 18th of January, 1945. 
was taken to Yubyanka prison in Moscow, uh, from where he was taken to a gulag somewhere in Siberia, where he never returned. We don't know when and how uh, he passed, but uh, there is a Rau Wallenberg Association as well in um, Budapest uh, that tries to collect uh, the personal memories of those uh, who survived the Holocaust in, uh, in Budapest or in Hungary as their main mission. And uh, we are running out of time because no one is getting younger. Um, so these are all the ways how Rao Wallenberg's memory are um, kept alive and how his uh, actions are celebrated in, uh, in Budapest. And on a personal note, I had the pleasure to, to meet one of those who was saved by Rao Wallenberg himself. Thank you. And Rao Wallenberg is ordinary, honorary citizen of the United States. Indeed. Indeed. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah, it looks like uh, you're over the COVID epidemic. Were most of your uh, population vaccinated? Uh, we are not over the pandemic, we just don't care about it. Um, Hungary is the country of no common sense. Neither was we a country of common sense during the height of the pandemic, nor we are of uh, common sense today. Um, reason why you can see hardly no restrictions uh, on the street, like wearing masks and so on, if you're having elections on Sunday. And um, we had to ease the restrictions before the elections, so people would feel that the current government actually fought the pandemic successfully. Um, if we keep an eye on the numbers, it doesn't necessarily show that, uh, which also influenced by the fact that in Hungary, we don't search for, um, for people, whether if they are you know, uh, COVID, uh, active COVID cases or not. Uh, the general concept in Hungary is that if we don't search, we don't find. Mm -hmm. And if we find, we don't test. If we don't test, those are not official cases. And this way we can uh, play around with the statistics. Okay, well, thank uh, you. But in terms of vaccination, a lot of people are vaccinated. Uh, a lot of people got their booster shot as well. Um, the vaccination pattern is not necessarily the same as in the United States because we use uh, Chinese and Russian uh, vaccinations as well that are considered less effective as Western vaccines like uh, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, uh, Jensen Jensen, and so on. Um, so those, for example, being vaccinated by Chinese vaccines, they not just had to get a booster shot, but a fourth shot as well. Um, in these terms, very important. Um, Jewish hospitals, institutions, they were not vaccinating with Chinese and with Russian vaccines. They used Pfizer, <laughs> to my understanding. So that is a part, that's a place where common sense um, applied, big time. <laughs> On personal note, I love Hungarian wines. Tokai or Balaton wines. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Hungarian wines have difficult times to make it to the United States. So the fact that you have access to Tokai wine and to wine from Balaton uh, means that you are a wine connoisseur and you are very dedicated to find Hungarian wines. So thank you very much for making the extra efforts to get wine from the bottom of my heart and from the bottom of my liver. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, if not, we'll uh, bid you goodbye, Adam. Thank you very much for your very uh, interesting, informative tour. It was, it was great. You're most welcome. Uh, my... the technical difficulties before. Ah, well, yeah. Uh, gremlins are always, uh, you know, uh, doing their uh, job, making everyone's life 
uh, difficult. Mm -hmm. You stay healthy, you stay safe, and I cross my fingers that sometime in the future we'll be able to meet in person. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah. Goodbye.